the Director General of WHO is determined to support tobacco control. Let us now hear what he has to say. Your Excellency, Mr. President, dear colleagues and friends, I thank Your Excellency and the government and people of Panama for hosting the conference of the parties to the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. <laughs> After the obligatory introductions, a song and dance and the COP10 was underway. What did we learn watching the FCTC COP10 this past month? Well, the first thing is that the COP10 was crawling with observers from Bloomberg-funded organizations dedicated to vaping restrictions and bans. These NGOs were allowed to attend, but not the media, consumers, and some representatives from member states. These groups, like the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and Vital Strategies, set expectations for tobacco control policy direction, informing the prohibitionist FCTC secretariat leadership group, writing background documents and sometimes policy proposals COP10 delegates would vote on. Most of the delegation statements must have been music to the WHO FCTC ears. We have been at the forefront of tobacco control and have been a driving force in negotiating the framework convention on tobacco control. As a response for their fast-growing market share and popularity among young, we have introduced a EU-wide ban on flavored hated tobacco products applicable as of October last year. Very well done. India has also re resolutely instituted a comprehensive nationwide ban on electronic cigarettes in 2019. This ban encompasses all categories of electronic nicotine delivery systems, heat not burn products, e-hookers, and similar devices. India's unwavering dedication to preserving public health continues to guide us in adapting proactive measures aimed at mitigating the escalating prevalence of vaping, particularly among the younger generation. We are also taking decisive action to reduce the appeal and availability of vapes to children, including by introducing a ban on disposable vapes. No child should use tobacco, and no child or non-smoker should use a vape. These new policies demonstrate the UK's commitment to the FCTC and our dedication to protecting the population from the harms of tobacco and our children from the risks from nicotine. But not everyone was following the script. Countries such as New Zealand stated how tobacco harm reduction was a critical part of their fight to get smoking rates down. Our approach has also involved a considered implementation of evidence-based harm reduction measures. This includes making a range of nicotine replacement products available to people who smoke, including therapeutic products like patches, gum, and stop smoking medicines. We have regulated vaping products under our smoke-free legislation. This must have irked the Secretariat. The country of St. Kitts and Nevis had their microphone turned off by the head of the conference in a rude way when they mentioned harm reduction during their country report. There is the misuse of the so-called harm production or reduced risk. The tobacco control community should not reject the idea of harm reduction per se. Is that the tone of the meeting seemed to be that anyone who promotes harm reduction is an enemy of the state and must be silenced by whatever means available. We would like to present a proposal a proposal to establish in line of the Article 5.3 of the Saint Convention. Kitson Nevis, please confine yourself to the agenda. At right. hand. And this we are not the proposing a working group, which I intend it to spend the time more time. Is for a proposal? Please uh, give us a, an update on your global on progress 
in some right. kids. Then we had the unprofessional behavior of the likes of Elvina Majiwa, a self-professed tobacco control advocate who is listed as a marketing and communication specialist from Kenya on her LinkedIn profile. She sent a nasty tweet to Joseph Magaro, a consumer advocate from Africa. Martin Cullop had this to say. What about the new advertising campaigns like the Spanish cancer flavor uh, fake vape? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's just um, disreputable, isn't it? It's just really, really shoddy. And like I've said, I mean, that, that's, it's not really an advertising campaign so much as it's a scare story, isn't it? And, and the guy, I think he was Secretary of State for Health in Spain. He should be thoroughly ashamed of himself. Uh, and the WHO and FCTCF, they've not taken them to a side room and given them a good old telling off, then, then they're really not a serious organization, are they? I mean, that's this tactless dark. stunt was originated by Javier Padilla from Spain. Even made the news. Habrán visto vapeadores de todos los sabores ahora que están tan de moda, pero ninguno como el que les vamos a mostrar. Es un vapeador con sabor a cáncer. And just to put the record straight online, uh, Cancer Research UK says that nicotine doesn't cause cancer. I don't think the American Cancer Society has ever said that nicotine causes cancer. So it's, it's completely wrong in its, in its entire formation. I mean, it's just, just wrong, just wrong. That's all I say. FCTC also turned a blind eye to bullying by observer NGOs, such as the Global Alliance for Tobacco Control, who were issuing daily reports blasting countries and advocates that were not following their script including, once again, awarding the Dirty Ashtray Award to the Philippines for their harm reduction efforts. So, who really calls the shots and keeps the FCTC delegates and approved observers in line? Certainly not the WHO, who are held to the same code of conduct as the UN, as a UN-affiliated organization. Jeannie Cameron explains. As a UN-affiliated organization, are the WHO, FCTC held to the same ethics and standards in their work as other UN-affiliated organizations? Do you um, want to come over here, Jean? Come. Oh, okay. Come in. Well, well, well yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean, under the Vienna Convention and various other, they, um, as a UN, as a UN body, they are like uh, all of them are. The problem is, is that um, the WHO had no experience in negotiating treaties, and when this first started, they, they, as I said, they were new at it. They were so bad at it that they had to bring in two WTO ambassadors, Sashis Correa and Chelso Amarin from Brazil, to actually conclude the FCTC because, because they, they didn't know what they were doing. They were health officials, not diplomats. The problem that occurs is that no one really is scrutinising the WHO about this sort of activity. When I used to work in those areas for the Australian government a long time ago, if you held the passport of a country that was in the negotiation, you could go in and watch it from the public gallery. And very early on, I used to go down there all the time between 2000 and 2003, and even the early cops, you know, using that same sort of um, taking people along to, to so they could learn and watch about the experience. What, what has happened, though, is, and I used to write about this a lot, is that no one was pushing back on the WHO in terms of what it's doing, and that still doesn't um, happen. If you talk to people in WTO or any of the other bodies, they, they don't understand it. They, they don't even believe it. It's really hard to um, convey to them that this is actually happening. I think the, the worry is that if the longer it goes on, it sort of becomes what's called customary, customary international law develops and that becomes what occurs in the WHO. So it is not normal. The WHO is doing this um, because no, there's no one, uh, there's no body above them, there's no, um, no one telling them that they can't do it. The, the only ones that can tell them that they can't do it are the national governments that are members of the WHO and they don't do that. Canada, as I mentioned to somebody, did stand up originally when they were trying to close the public gallery, but no other governments supported Canada and over time that's just become the normal process. So the only way to open up these things to scrutiny and to have 
others from consumers to the public, any one of the public who wants to observe, then it requires governments to say we want that and other governments to support them. Having said that, they are government processes in a sense. Governments go into these to negotiate and it's, it is, you know, a place for governments but what they have done is an enabled NGOs and international NGOs to go into them as well that carry a lot of weight and persuasion of their arguments. Too often the officials who are in there, so even though they come from a health department, they may know nothing about this particular issue. They're, they're in the desk job doing the health job. They get to go to Geneva or to Panama to participate. But it's just the next thing in their, their, um, on the agenda. So I think there is room to change it, but it's become so entrenched now that it will be hard, but it's not impossible. Thank you very much. And if we didn't think we couldn't change it, we wouldn't be here. Most telling of the frustration of the prohibitionists was this statement from Dr. Adriana Blanco, FCTC Secretariat, during the closing session. The interests of the tobacco industry or even of smokers should never serve as justification for legitimizing products that could send even a single child down the path of addiction. The WHO Code of Ethics, as well as the UN Code of Conduct, mandate inclusion and non-discrimination. This was obviously ignored by the disgusting behavior that took place in Panama. The truth will prevail in spite of the naysayers. We just need to keep going. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next month. And until then, stay safe and be well.